Uh, it's Alethea. I will. I don't know how she, how you pronounced it, but Alethea. Alethea. <laughs> okay, we're going live now. Now. <laughs> now. You're live. Okay. Welcome to our Facebook Live audience. I never know when, when uh, we're actually live uh, on Facebook. Welcome to everybody that's watching on CBC Indigenous and CBC The National Facebook page. I'm Duncan McHugh, um, correspondent on the National Host of Cross Country Checkup. Today we're talking Indigenous cinema and we have an absolutely amazing panel to join us and to answer your questions, have some discussions about this new wave, next wave uh, of Indigenous cinema. Uh, Jesse Wente is the director of the Indigenous Screen office and the Shinabe, uh, and also a film critic that CBC uh, radio audiences will know and adore for many years now. Uh, welcome. Uh, you said Jackson is an Anishinaabe uh, filmmaker who has just finished a project uh, on a VR film. Uh, and what's the name of that the film? Uh, it's called Badabin. Badabin. First Light. Yeah. Badabin First Light. So we want to talk about uh, VR, how it was working in, in VR. It's different. Uh, and Alethea Arnakuk Barilla uh, is an Inuk filmmaker. Uh, you may know her from her very. Uh, celebrated uh, documentary, Angry Inuk, which has been winning awards uh, all over the place. So welcome to you all. Um, we're going to be, please send us your questions and we can, uh, I'll, I'll pass them on to this panel. But let me start uh, by that term. I mean, there's no doubt that indigenous cinema is experiencing a moment right now, a moment. There have been uh, blips in the past, uh, moments in the past. Uh, I think of Dances with Wolves. I think of uh, Atanarjawat. I think of Rhymes with Young Ghouls. But but there is something going on right now. Do, can you describe why that's happening, Jesse? Sure. Uh, I mean, you mentioned the uh, new Indigenous New Wave, which is um, something that, that I think of, of Atanarjawat being part of. I wouldn't ever call Dances with Wolves an Indigenous. Uh, film that, that that's a Hollywood western, uh, very much in there, very much in keeping with their tradition of, of Hollywood westerns. Um, but I, you know, I think of the new wave as those filmmakers, uh, Sterling Harjo, Chris Ayer uh, in the in the U.S., Zacharias Canuck uh, uh, here, who sort of took what was was started as Indigenous cinema. Remember, Indigenous cinema largely started as in the documentary form globally, not just just here. Um, but if you think of the National Film Board starting in the 60s, started training uh, uh, Indigenous people to make film, and you had Alanis Sabamaswin really established herself there. And virtually at the same time in New Zealand and Australia, you started to have Indigenous filmmakers get trained up. That was the initial wave of what I would describe as almost activist style cinema. That is very much still an undercurrent, I think, in Indigenous cinema, that documentary is still maybe the most pervasive form. And there's a lot of industrial reasons I would suggest uh, for that as well in terms of access and, and the way these things are funded and, and made. Documentaries have a lower barrier in a lot of ways for filmmakers. Sterling, Zach sort of started to extend that beyond um, documentary, the strict documentary storytelling, uh, started into more narrative films. Now, uh, with folks like Alethea and Lisa, I think we're, we're getting into a new generation altogether that's starting to play more with the genre. Like, so Ryan for Young Ghouls, to me, mm -hmm. signals the start of something much different than what the, the new wave was, which was about taking those documentary community-based techniques and transferring them into their settings. Now you've got indigenous people who were, came up not just watching indigenous cinema, but watching all of Hollywood of the 70s and 80s, and were just as influenced by Star Wars or Night of the Living Dead than they are Annalise's films. And actually those, often I find, those inspirations are married. It's Alanis and George Romero. <laughs> and that produces what I think we're going to see, which is indigenous viewpoints on cinema uh, genre in a way that we haven't seen before. And that actually, we've already seen in, in New Zealand, they've made a film called Deadlands, which was an entirely pre-contact a contact Maori kung fu movie, like martial arts film, you're going to see a lot of that, and I think that will even explode the popularity of indigenous cinema beyond um, what we've even seen to this point, uh, because that will suddenly mean audiences who are familiar with watching zombie movies and sci-fi movies and all these sorts of things 
we'll be able to suddenly see these movies in that same sort of uh, content. I want to get to our filmmakers, but I also want to get to the questions that are coming in from our audience already. So uh, Opichi Miller uh, sent in a question. Is Adam Beach having any impact in the industry with his film school and boycotting using non-Indigenous actors for films? So for those of you who don't know, Adam Beach, uh, well-known uh, Manitoba actor, Indigenous actor, started up his own film school a couple years ago. Uh, so the question is, is, is that having any impact? Do you, do you guys, do the, do the filmmakers uh, want to want to talk about that uh, a little bit? I'm in the Arctic in Indian territory, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I'm only just starting to dabble in uh, drama. In drama, so I, I feel really unqualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to leave that to you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll say beyond what you just said, I'm aware that that uh, school exists, but that's about all that I know about it. Okay. So I'm also not really qualified to speak to it. Um, I think training for fiction, indigenous filmmaking is great. I work with the National Screen Institute that has for many, many years done training for documentary filmmakers who are indigenous. But uh, other than that, I don't know much. Do you? Uh, I mean, in my capacity as the director of the screen office, I've been in touch with, with Adam, certainly aware of this, this school, and I certainly appreciate his stance around the performers on screen. This is still an ongoing issue. Uh, faced by Indigenous peoples when it comes to casting, uh, you know. Wait, 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 what's the issue? Uh, whitewashing, you know, meaning that you, you typically, the long history of cinema, not only are the directors and the producers of most movies about Indigenous people not Indigenous, but a lot of the people on screen are not Indigenous either. Uh, and, I, and I think that that is likewise limiting an opportunity for Indigenous performers and, and artists. Um, but also, quite frankly, I think you lose a textual quality to the art. I mean, we were, you know, it came up earlier, we were talking about The Godfather. Mm -hmm. You know, and the fact that when, when they hired Francis Ford Coppola to direct it, I mean, the fact that he was Italian-American was key to the, his hiring, and I would suggest how we now understand that film and see that film and experience it, it's key to our experiencing mm -hmm. of that film. Just like when Marty Scorsese makes a, a, a movie set in his, Mean Street set in his old neighborhood, there's a reason that stands up better than a lot of the other movies made in the exact same milieu and about the exact same thing. So not only is it about equal opportunity, Duncan, it's also just about the quality of the work. Like these the movies are better when people involved have a much deeper connection to the subject matter. Uh, thanks to you for that question, uh, Peachy. Uh, Leslie Burchard has a question for the two filmmakers. Uh, what kinds of stories do Lisa and uh, Alethea most want to tell? Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give away all our secrets before the film is already. <laughs> you know, it's tough because um, you know when you're when you come from a community that's been so um, not not underrepresented but misrepresented mm -hmm. on screen for so like a century. Mm -hmm. um, you feel a responsibility uh, to tell stories that matter, that uh, are not just entertaining, that make a difference in people's lives. So there's always this fine line you're walking between wanting to have some fun and entertain people and also make a difference in your community. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I, I think we carry a lot of responsibility, whether it's self-imposed or community-imposed. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in stories that humanize us, that make us three-dimensional people, that uh, you know aren't just uh, addicts or violent men mm -hmm. or sexually assaulted women. The, the same script I get over and over and over again from um, non-native writers and producers contact me wanting me to help them with their project. It's the same story. There's uh, a violent native man, there's a, a, a sexually or physically abused native woman, somebody's an addict and a white guy comes along to save the day. And, and there's usually like a, a spirit animal or a, a, an elder or a stoic hunter that's like going to give some cryptic piece of advice to help the white guy save the day. And it, I get that so often. Uh, and I'm interested in doing not that. <laughs> okay, what about you? What stories well, do you want to tell? I would follow what Alethea said. I mean, apart, you know, there's often this dichotomy of like, oh, something that's meaningful about our culture or is important politically or it's entertaining. And mm -hmm. I just don't buy that whatsoever. Number one, good stories are complicated. People are complicated. So good scripts whether they're fiction or whether it's documentary, it's about the complications of who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I would say one of my number one pet peeves 
like what Alethea was saying, is like these oversimplified stories. They don't do justice to the art of filmmaking. They don't do justice to, you know, the poor victim native people or the savior or the, you know, even the evil, you know, uh, perpetrators that come around. So I, you know, I made a residential school musical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was hard hitting. There was Michael Jackson inspired dance routines. Like, I don't think it's an either or. And given the resources that the overculture has had, I think there's amazing stories, like Jesse was saying, where these two things come together. We don't let go of our politics, we don't leave our communities behind, but we're telling amazing stories. Because imagine a, a horror movie about residential schools. Mm -hmm. Could this not be both utterly terrifying, but also eye-opening for a lot of, of people? I think there's so much to that, to that they are mutually exclusive, entertaining, and thought-provoking. We, uh, we've got more questions coming in, but the, I, w I want to ask you guys something that's, that I've been wrestling with. Uh, Taika Waititi uh, directed uh, Thor Ragnarok, which you know just did gangbusters at the at the, the box office, big superhero movie. Is that because it had an, uh, a Maori? Uh, so, so some viewers may not know, but but uh, Taika Waititi is a, a well-known Maori director. Because it had a Maori director, does it qualify as Indigenous cinema? I'm just curious to to, to know what you guys have. To think about that. Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah, why? Why? Uh, well, anyone who knows Taika's work. Yes. Uh, Taika's work. Uh, that was a Taika film. Mm -hmm. So you think like, how could how could he possibly sort of, you know, carry the ball up the field or whatever the sports metaphor is to make a Taika film on a superhero movie? And he completely did. And I would say one example, and I'll pass it to these guys, is like, look at the power structures in that. Look at the way he sort of humorously pokes fun at the different power structures, and even the role of the superhero as somehow like all powerful above and beyond. He brings that superhero to earth, and he does it in a hugely hilarious way. Mm -hmm. And so metaphorically, what you're looking at is someone who's taking the piss a little bit, if I'm allowed to say that, you are. out of the power structures in that movie, and I think it's brilliant. You guys are nodding? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, uh, uh, authorship of cinema, historically, and, and there's lots of debate about whether this is right or wrong, but historically, you trace that back to the director. As the, as the per primary decision maker on set when the movie is being made. Uh, with peripheral players being the producer and the writer as the other key authorial figures in the production of the film, Taika both directed and wrote, he wrote that, that film. It's distinctly different than all the other previous Thor movies. It totally reimagines that character. I read that film as an entire movie about colonialism mm -hmm. and, and the, the Thor, members of Thor's family coming to grips with that they are colonists, that they have, they have perpetrated violent colonial oppression on worlds throughout the universe, coming to recognize that and realizing that the only escape from that is to tear down the very colonial structures that they helped uh, build, I think is, is you know, central to Taika's work. I think Taika is, uh, and I don't make this comparison likely, but uh, like a Hitchcock-like figure mm -hmm. in indigenous cinema, in both that his authorial, authorial line or authorship can be traced from every single movie. You can tell that it's a Taika film. Also like Hitchcock, he's in all of his movies. Many people may not know that Taika <laughs> yes. is very much a character in Thor. He plays the blue guy. He plays Korg yeah. the Rock, yeah. and he's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, he's Korg the Rock revolutionary, yeah. <laughs> who in one of my favorite gags says, uh, I was going to start a revolution, but I didn't print enough pamphlets, <laughs> which is, an, I think, a, an inside indigenous joke yes. that I laughed at in the theater, but no one else thought yep. was, was as hilarious. Yep. Um, and so I think he's very much that figure. And I think what's important, industrial Duncan, yes. is that there was a very, um, Taika had a pathway in his career created around the supports he got in New Zealand and elsewhere, um, through festivals and all sorts of other places, just distribution, that allowed him to get to a place where you, you could access and direct a, a $200 million Marvel franchise film. This is very verified air. I'm not sure we have that pathway. In Canada. In Canada for 
I wouldn't even just say indigenous filmmakers, but all English Canadian filmmakers. I think there is actually a pathway to Hollywood for French Canadian mm -hmm. filmmakers, because there's already uh, uh, French Canadian filmmakers who, who are making large blockbuster films. But we need a similar support network for filmmakers like I'm sitting beside incredibly talented artists who, if they want to direct a $200 million blockbuster, I would love to see direct a $200 million blockbuster and create the, the, the pathway and the support systems to get those artists, if that's what they want to do, to that position where they can be in a place to actually do that. Uh, Susan Woodley uh, has a question. Uh, thank you, Susan, for asking the question. Uh, do you, for the filmmakers, uh, do you identify as an indigenous filmmaker or a filmmaker who happens to be indigenous? And is there a difference? Yeah. Lithia. Lithia. I love this question. I absolutely identify as a you know, filmmaker. But I think it's really important that people are careful with language like that. Mm -hmm. I'll use an example. Um, was it last year? My film uh, won the Audience Choice Award at the TIFF um, Canada's Top Ten Film Festival, and in all the materials, I was being listed as uh, one of one of Canada's top Inuit directors mm -hmm. or top mm -hmm. female directors. And I really took issue with that because my film won the top awards at the the, the major film festivals in Canada, and I. You know, it's, it's awkward to say, especially as Indigenous people, we're taught not to brag, but I, I take issue with being called the top female filmmaker, top native filmmaker, because that year, I killed it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I was one of Canada's top directors yes. uh, that year. I do identify as an Inuit filmmaker, but when you, when you use a qualifier like that in that instance, you're implying that maybe they're not at the top of the overall game, but only at the top of the native game or the mm -hmm. game. So it, it's important to, uh, um, to make that distinction sometimes. Lisa, uh, indigenous filmmaker, filmmaker who happens to be indigenous, doesn't matter to you. I would just echo what Alethea said. I mean, for so long, what I've seen, and I've been in the business for 10 plus years too, is that there is a ghettoization, and there's a way that people look at indigenous filmmakers as somehow making something off, you know, at the kitty table. And that's absolutely not the case. And to whatever degree that the successes, in fact, the successes of indigenous filmmakers have been incredibly strong in comparison to any other group in Canada. Like we have won awards, our films have gone around the world, they've been recognized broadly. There's just no doubt of the talent pool. So any kind of limitation is not uh, because of our content or any of, it is because of institutional um, problems where we cannot get the funding to make a superhero movie or to do, and whenever we do, the, the results are just gangbusters, like Alethea's film, like A Ten Arduet, like Rhymes for Young Ghouls. They all just bust out. And so I think uh, we have to be really careful about the way we put us at the kitty table. Uh, we couldn't have a, a panel on Indigenous cinema without the uh, question of cultural appropriation. Uh, it comes up. So I appreciate uh, Geraldine Webster, uh, who is asking this question. It has come up for, for many years now. Uh, how do you prevent cultural appropriation in film? Uh, Geraldine wants to know. You'll Anyone want to? Who tackles that first? I, I say the team, the key creatives, are Indigenous. And that's what gets funded. That's my first and foremost, is that uh, you know we have an issue in Canada where the funders go to teams that they think are safe, and those teams are overwhelmingly non-Indigenous. And that is a level. Yeah, but break it down for a non-film guy. What, when you say creatives, who, who do you need to be involved for it to be? Uh, to, for director first and foremost. So the director is the author of a film. Uh, the writer, as well as producers uh, on a lesser level, those are the three uh, areas. Those people have the most control over a film. Okay. And those are the people that need to at least be predominantly indigenous for it to be an indigenous film, and you will not have appropriation. Whenever we uh, compromise on that, we say, well, you know, it's adapted from an original, that, that's where you get into appropriation. It becomes an, an enormous amount of work to keep that from happening when you don't have that core creative team being indigenous. And I just want to add also, it means we need indigenous people in decision making positions, which is why it's really exciting to have the indigenous green out of the office now. Yes. Are there, are there, oh sorry, go ahead. Also, I would say, um, uh, just having key creators does not mean appropriation won't happen. 
-hmm. It could still happen with Way less likely. It's less likely, <laughs> but we also have to acknowledge that indigenous nations appropriate within ourselves. Yes. Uh, and that, that can happen, and so that there's there's some of that as well. And I would also say um, to, the, to the, the person who asked the question, I don't actually think you can prevent it. You know, like to say that it will just cease to exist, zero percent, I think that would deny like all of colonial history and art making. Yeah. I think you can limit it, and I think there's a, a, a number of ways that um, Alethea and Elisa have already described, I think, one big way. I think funding um, in Canada, where filmmaking is primarily funded through some private public participation on the funding side, um, to me, you can actually lobby those bodies to say when you're deciding to fund, an Indigenous film is defined by these parameters, and if it's not, then it's not Indigenous. Uh, and just to be clear uh, on that, I think to actually get to the prevention of it requires a massive cultural change so that non-Indigenous filmmakers don't even think of it in their head that this is appropriate. And that is a much longer game that requires access for artists to equal access to the same sort of structures and systems that support non-Indigenous filmmakers and screen artists in Canada for a very extended long period of time so that you can start to get cultural change that will then mean that over time we realize that this isn't something we necessarily should be doing. You know, appropriation, right, is a is a tool of colonial capitalism, um, and it takes a larger cultural change to get out of it, because it's embedded in how colonial nation states have created themselves, created their own stories, is the appropriation uh, of indigenous cultures, lives, bodies, land. And so to get over all of those appropriations, you actually have to shift the culture, and that means getting indigenous storytellers on your screens at a much more frequent basis than we see. Uh, Shiar Wilson uh, has a question. What steps are you taking? I assume this is for the filmmakers, but, but Jesse can probably fill us in too. Uh, what steps are you taking to bring an authentic view to the films that you're making? Often, our stories are diluted with ideas for entertainment value. An authentic view. It's lived experience, <laughs> I would say. Yep. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously not all Indigenous people have had the same experience. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that has really struck me about the Imaginative Film and Media Festival, when I first started going in 2004, it's coming up on its 20th year uh, next year, so it's been around a while was that I recognized that there were there was an embracing of and a celebration of all the different ways that we are indigenous. And that includes people who were adopted on the 60s scoop, who grew up on the reserve, who live in the north. So there isn't, I mean, I think another uh, misconception is that there's, you know, the pan-Indian. But there is an authentic all, view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this one view. Yep. And I think one of the things that we tend to do just naturally is speak from where we come from. Or when working in partnership, for example, I worked on a film with the Guasal and Aquadel people out on the West Coast. That was their story. Well, I worked very closely in partnership with them. I spent time with them. There were ways that I ensured that I was being a conduit for the stories that they wanted to tell, but I was bringing my filmmaking prowess to the project. So I think uh, one thing that I know is like, you have seen me do a lot of residential school films. Well, that's because my mom went to residential school. And that's something I know very well, and it's something I'm passionate about. And like any artist, I think whatever our lived experience is, that's what we lead with, and that's what we're most passionate about. Here's a question. Uh, give, give advice to some young fi filmmakers here. Uh, Running Black Wolf has a question. Where do you start when you want to do a biography film with no cash on hand? <laughs> 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 to, 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 to young filmmakers, what's, 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 the, what's the best advice that you would give when they're trying to start out and they're trying to pull together a budget? Yeah. Two things that I'll say really quickly. Number one, if wherever you live there is a film co-op, um, join it and volunteer on other people's films and take whatever courses you have the means to take. A lot of times they're really inexpensive, so you can take introductory courses, but get out on other people's sets, see, I mean, filmmaking's an apprenticeship, so get that experience. Um, see if you can get to a film school if that's how you choose to go. And then as soon as you have the means, uh, we have a lot of arts councils in this country, so apply for funding, make a short. I think a lot of times uh, people are emerging, they want to make a feature right out of the gate, mm -hmm. but start with what you can do with the means that you have, and now you can do that really cheaply. Yeah, I would, I would 
speaking from experience, uh, biting off more than you can chew is not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. My, my first film was a, a TV hour documentary, and it nearly killed me. And nearly Hours a long like documentary, yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, I, I really wish I had started with short films. I really wish I had started with, you know, just my friends. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't have iPhones back then that could make movies the way you can now. So uh, I think it's really accessible now in a way that it wasn't when I was starting. Um, do you think that's a good route to start out? YouTube, uh, you know, using your iPhone, yes. posting on YouTube. Yes. Totally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I was going to say, use your this. Yes. That's, that, that's where you should start. A biography might not be the perfect thing to start with because depending on whose story you're telling, that may be a challenge. But there's lots of things like so. I would think a combination of what means do you have to make it, and then find a story that you can tell within those means, as, as you guys. Have said um, but then use your phone like like it's cheap it doesn't cost you anything I started making films with my friends back in the 80s with like our dad's big thing just in our backyard using you know stuff from the butcher so to make VHS beta yeah, VHS, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. yes I'm that old thing um, that, but that's how that's how we started and like again my expectation wasn't this is going to be in a film festival my expectation was Let's make a film and see how cool it is and get started. Um, and then to Alethea's point, yes, at some point, reach out to the Indigenous screen office. That's what we're, we're here for. And get good sound. Sound, yeah. you got, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sound guy, thank Very you. Good. Yeah, sound's so important. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's great. Great. That is that, the number one overlooked bit. It, yeah. Everybody thinks that, that uh, TV and, and, and film is about the visual and the power of the visual, but these you can see from the reactions, sound is so important. It's so, yeah. actually more important. It's more, it is, yeah, yeah. absolutely. If you don't hear the door go, you know, you know, you know yeah. think of the shower scene in Psycho. Yes. Take the score and the sound out of that. She's taking a shower and so, you know, it's not as nearly as scary. Think of Jaws, yep. a movie where the, the giant mechanical shark they were using broke. Yep. So they had to think of ingenious ways and, and it's Charlie just, Williams comes up with a very simple score and boom. So if, if, you're, if you're using your iPhone, do get a rig that has good audio, uh, good, good mics and things like yeah. that. Uh, Laura Lagstaff says, uh, recasting, uh, so uh, regarding casting, uh, Métis are one of the three indigenous jurisdictions, yet the Métis Look, look, is not understood. There are some issues there. Any thoughts about that? We don't have any Métis on the panel here, but, but does it's anyone want to weigh in? It's a clear question, but I, I, I do want to speak a bit to uh, looking data. Yes, sure. On screen. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of people maybe don't recognize um, a Métis person when they see them as Indigenous, uh, but I think part of Indigenous filmmakers telling Indigenous stories means we get to represent what our communities actually look like. And sometimes we look like the stereotypical Inuk or First Nations person or Métis person, but sometimes we're mixed blood or there was adoption involved or you had a Scottish whaler in your bloodline a few generations ago. You know, a friend of mine is, has bright red hair and blue eyes, but she grew up in our community and speaks Inuk to too. Like it's, uh, you know, we don't, we don't all look the way um, the country necessarily expects us to look mm -hmm. sometimes because we haven't been at the helm of our films often enough over the, over the last century. Um, is, is that just a, a, a color of skin issue or is it a matter of uh, hair? Yeah. I remember when I was a child actor back in yes. the 80s. Yes. I, had the, I didn't I, know this about you, Jess. Yeah, I know. It's shocking. <laughs> I went out for Degrassi junior high, but I didn't get it. Okay. It's always this thing is a missed opportunity. <laughs> Imagine the stories of Degrassi. Yeah, you you could have been in the zit uh, remedy, uh, man. <laughs> I, what, what exactly? <laughs> break that man. Um, but I remember my agent saying, you know, you have short hair, uh, you know, I don't think you're going to get cast in a lot of things without long, the long flowing locks, yeah. uh, hair. And I think that is a comment and sort of approach that I've heard a lot from uh, artists that, are, you know, on-screen artists in, in our community, that there is that specific look. But I absolutely agree with everything Olivia just said. If we are in charge of our stories, that won't even be, yeah. and it, it's won't not, be an issue. It's not just skin color. It's also, like, the, the occupation of the people mm -hmm. on the screen. It's like, a, it's, a, it's a lot of things. Costuming? Is, is, is that, Costuming, is that, that come uh, into it? You know, I often hear people say, you know, 
should wouldn't it feel more authentic, authentic if it's grittier or you know? And, and I, I think that I think that's kind of like a, an assumption where uh, indigeneity equals poverty. Um, so it, it's really important that it, uh, we get to portray ourselves on screen because sometimes we're lighter skinned, darker skinned. Sometimes we have pink hair. Sometimes we have long braided hair. Sometimes we're surgeons or police officers. And we drink and, cortados in a coffee shop. Yeah. It, <laughs> Um, for uh, here's a, uh, a question uh, for audiences who don't know much uh, about indigenous storytelling. What films or docs? I, I know this could be a long list. So, so what's what, what's one film or documentary uh, that you would recommend they watch as a, as a, an essential or a primer on indigenous cinema, indigenous storytelling? Do we have to just say one? one? Uh, okay. What? Okay. Uh, 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 at the Fast Runner. Why? Why? Because it's been voted at the top film in Canada's entire Ever. history. Ever. Yeah. It was made completely from an indigenous perspective before this was, you know, the props, the costumes, the actors, everything was made in that community and as the community wanted it made. The actors were, you know, had living in their own life. It's so authentic. Uh, and it's an incredible film. Like, it has you on the edge of your seat. And uh, anyway, and it led the way for a whole generation, as Jesse was saying earlier, of people who saw what was possible and got inspired to pick up the camera. Lisa votes for uh, Athanar Jawad, so you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> 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 um, it, 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 it's, it's hard to such a beautiful, brilliant indigenous film. Mm -hmm. It's hilarious and heartbreaking. I love it because, you know, the villain character is nuanced, you, they're vulnerable, the children are brilliant. There's just, no one's like the, the black and white character. No one's just like the bad guy or the good guy or the smart person or the whatever. All of the characters are, are fully formed people and, and he does that better than I think most films in general. And it has Michael Jackson. And it has Michael Jackson. So how can you how can you fight that? Uh, well, of course, seek out movies by Alethea <laughs> and, and Lisa. Um, Rise Rain Rules by Jeff Barnaby, I think, is a is a great film. Um, sort of the, that next generation coming up. Deadlands, the movie I mentioned from uh, New Zealand. But to go back to um, you know, I would say any movie by Alan Lisa Bonser, yes. most of which are available on the National Film Awards website for free, so you can go right there and see them. Likewise, um, most of the production of Zach's company, Asuma, is also available for free on the web at asuma.tv, so you just have to go and you can watch all of these incredible works. But I want to mention uh, a film that, for me, still lasts me, which is uh, Gil Cardinal's film, Foster Child, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is all a personal short documentary that he made about his own uh, experience to be a foster child in, in Canada. This movie made in 1984. Um, I think it is a remarkable piece of work, uh, the type of work that at the time just didn't exist uh, on film in, in Canada, the type of work that I think has um, influenced an, enorm an entire generation of filmmakers, and a film that if viewed right here today would speak volumes about what's happening today in Canada. This is a movie that none of its importance is actually lost because the same thing Gil is exploring in his film is happening today to Indigenous children in Canada. That film is also available for uh, the NFB uh, website. It's Gil made for National Film Board. And I, sh I should shout out to the NFB. That, that has uh, made exposure to, to Indigenous documentary in particular. The fact that they are putting that digital catalog out there now, that, that really does help. The fact that you can just go online and, and find so, so much of that material now instead of having to go to the public library or wait for a, a, some kind of film festival to come. Well, especially now they've organized it in its own indigenous section. Yes. And actually, they've done that with indigenous curators. It makes a big they difference. That, Huge that difference. Huge difference. We're on the road home. Thank you so much to everyone that, that's uh, asking questions. So there's uh, one last question uh, that's that's come in here, uh, and it's a simple one. What do you think is the is the future of indigenous cinema? I think TV series are coming quickly. You know, we see so much of our screen content now are TV series, mm -hmm. and I have there are so many people that are developing series that I'm really excited about. 
and I think that a bigger budget feature films mm -hmm. that uh, allow us to really play around with the craft mm -hmm. the way that we have been waiting to do for a while. She nailed it. Okay. Uh, the future imagined, Duncan, is where the appearance of indigenous people on screens or in the production of content is no longer extraordinary, mm -hmm. that it is all the time, mm -hmm. every day, and that we reach a point in Canada where actually that's expected. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you so much to everyone that's watching uh, on our Facebook live stream. This, this panel uh, was convened to also do uh, another panel on CBC The National. Uh, so we, that will appear on CBC The National on uh, National June, June 20th. The day before National Indigenous Peoples Day, June twentieth. Uh, so, you, we're, this is a pre, this is a preview. This is a live interactive preview for what's coming up on June twentieth, which is going to be so much better. It's you have to tune into that. Uh, but thank you so much to everyone that, that sent in uh, your questions. But most of all, thank you to uh, Lisa and Alethea and Jesse for, for taking time out and, and answering uh, some of these questions. Uh, Jimmy Glitch, thank you so much. Uh, take care and thanks to everyone for watching.